This is The Red Line, where we talk to three expert witnesses on one issue shaping the news both here and overseas. You would have to go back 40 years to remember a time when the UK was more unstable and divisive than it is right now, where half the country resents the other half and political differences divide neighbourhoods and households. Since the Brexit referendum of 2016, we have seen two Prime Ministers resign and the country grind to a halt simply to argue amongst itself about the direction going forward, to stay in Europe or to leave. In 2017, the Conservative Party forced the UK back to the polls to try and shore up the party support they thought they had so they could get Brexit done. At the time, they thought they were in a winning position, but the election only made it worse for them, introducing a hung parliament to take the reins of the United Kingdom. Now, with an even stiffer deadlock in the Parliament, the UK once again is being dragged to the polls, the mandate being tossed back to the people. This has already proved to be a pivotal election for the UK, with economic reforms, nationalisation, lies, Scottish independence, overspending and deals with dodgy foreign countries. You can be forgiven for not being able to keep up with this race. So to help you navigate these troubled and murky waters, we bring out our first guest. Part 1 Breaking up the band. Well, the big thing facing the UK at the moment, of course, is the Brexit process. Um, Britain voted to leave the European Union in a referendum in June 2016, so that's three and a half years ago now. And, and I guess everything in British politics since then has revolved around the question of how um, Brexit should take place, what the UK's future relationship with the European Union should be and the parties have been fighting over, um, both within themselves and between themselves, um, over what form that should take. Peter Sloman is a professor of politics at Cambridge University and is also the author of Transfer State, focusing on the politics of modern Britain. He joins us today. Um, in the parliament that was elected in 2017, the Conservatives didn't have an overall majority. Um, they were governing with the support of the Democratic Unionist Party, which is a, a Northern Ireland party, um, a party predominantly supported by Protestants in Northern Ireland who want to keep Northern Ireland part of the UK um, instead of, for instance, um, moving it closer to the Irish Republic. Arrangement was always an unstable one um, and it, it's broken down um, over, over the summer um, as a result of disagreements over the form Brexit should take. Um, and at the same time, um, Boris Johnson had removed the whip from about 20 Conservative MPs who had disagreed with his approach to Brexit. Um, so he no, no longer had a majority in Parliament. Um, he then came back with a, a new withdrawal agreement with the European Union, um, which Parliament um, voted for in principle um, at second reading um, in, in October. Um, but it's clear that there is still scope for very significant disagreement over the details of that. So if the referendum happened in 2016, why has it taken so long to get Brexit done? Well, I mean, I, I guess there are, two, there are two answers to that. One is that um, disentangling a country from almost 50 years of close association with its neighbours in a closely integrated economic and political bloc is always going to be really complicated and so there are there are going to be very um, difficult negotiations many of them still to come uh, over for instance how the uk relates to the eu in terms of trade um, in terms of agriculture in terms of um, security cooperation and so on um, but more fundamentally the um, 2016 referendum um, saw Britain vote um, by 52% to 48% to leave the European Union, um, but there was no clear sense of what um, that meant. Um, so there is a majority for leaving in principle. Um, there is as yet um, no clarity um, over whether the British public is prepared to support any particular um, withdrawal agreement. And that was the problem that Theresa May had, um, I guess this time last year, um, when she came forward with a withdrawal agreement that neither um, the pro-Europeans who want to keep Britain either in the European Union or closely aligned with it were happy with, um, nor um, the hardline Brexiteers who want to cut Britain off from, um, from any future uh, constraints on, for instance, its ability to negotiate new trading relationships with Australia or the United States or other countries, they weren't happy with it either. 
and Theresa May found herself caught between two stools. Um, Boris Johnson, the new Prime Minister, has been trying to find a way of um, bringing together um, the Conservative Party in particular um, around some form of withdrawal agreement. So why now? I mean, quite famously, the UK has five-year election cycles, which means Boris Johnson didn't need to call an election for another three or so years. So why call it now? Um, so Boris Johnson wanted to hold an election, um, I guess while he was in a relatively new stage as, as Prime Minister, a relatively fresh face, so that he could get a majority to, to pilot um, this um, withdrawal agreement through and get Brexit done, as he put it. Um, the opposition Labour Party has been calling for an election ever since the last election, um, because Jeremy Corbyn wants to become Prime Minister. Um, the Liberal Democrats uh, and the SNP uh, the Scottish National Party, both um, anti-Brexit parties, both parties which want to keep the UK in the European Union, um, have supported an election because they see this as perhaps the last chance to um, prevent Brexit going ahead. So unlike the United States, the British elections have quite a few parties competing. So let's go through a few of the major ones and get a better idea on what each of them stands for. So let's start with the current government, the Conservative Party, which is also known as the Tories. What does the Conservative Party stand for? Well, the Conservatives are Britain's main centre-right party. They have been um, a powerful political force um, ever since the 19th century, traditionally the party of the establishment, of business, of, of the governing class, um, and of Conservative values. Mrs Thatcher's early years were all about um, liberalising the British economy, facing down the power of the trade unions, privatising nationalised industries. And as time went on, she was looking for new, new enemies. Um, and she found an enemy to fight against and to define herself against towards the end of her time in office in, in the European communities. But they have been radicalised over the last 20 or 30 years um, as a result of, I guess, populist influences um, particularly around opposition to the European Union, which has become probably the party's defining um, commitment. And what about the largest opposition party, the British Labour Party? What do they stand for? Well, the Labour Party in Britain, much like the Labour Party in Australia, is the, you know, the main party of the left rooted in the trade union movement, um, historically committed to socialism, uh, a public ownership, redistribution, and, and a vision of, of greater equality. Well, Labour um, elected Jeremy Corbyn as leader in 2015. He's a, I guess, a, um, a, a fairly radical left-wing figure who's been around the block since the 1980s. Um, and he's committed to a fairly traditional socialist agenda. Um, so Labour in this election is calling for the return to public ownership of the railways, of the Royal Mail, um, of utilities like gas and electricity. Um, they've also promised to um, to nationalise the broadband um, infrastructure and provide everyone with free broadband, broadband, which is a pretty big ticket um, um, economic pledge. Um, and more broadly, they, they are talking about ending austerity, um, scrapping student tuition fees, um, providing free personal care for um, senior citizens in, in nursing homes. Um, it's a really expansive programme for um, expanding the role of the state uh, and, and investing in, in public services. And what about the Liberal Democrats, or as people might know them, the Lib Dems? So the Liberal Democrats are Britain's, um, I guess, centre-left Liberal Party, um, with a history dating right back to the 19th century when um, Liberal Prime Ministers like William Gladstone were, were towering political figures. Um, and I guess like other Liberal parties in, say, Canada, and, and many parts of Europe, they are committed to um, achieving greater social justice uh, and investing in public services, um, dealing with environmental issues, but without the kind of um, socialist intervention uh, in the economy which the Labour Party has sometimes favoured. Um, the Lib Dems going into this election are, are making their opposition to Brexit um, a selling point. Um, they've always been a pro-European party. Um, for much of the last 20 years, Labour has been a pro-European party as well, uh, but Jeremy Corbyn comes from a part of the, the kind of hard left, um, which has traditionally been Eurosceptic, um, which has seen the European Union as a kind of capitalist club um, that stands in the way of, of socialist um, policies. Uh, and so the Liberal Democrats have been trying to capitalise on that and attract voters 
um, particularly younger voters, but also voters in London and the southeast of England, um, who are opposed to Brexit, who want to keep Britain um, closely associated with the European Union. And what about the SNP? Well, the SNP, the Scottish National Party, has been an increasingly powerful force in Scottish politics since the 1970s. It, it's campaigned for Scottish independence. Um, and since 2007, uh, it has run the um, devolved administration in Scotland. Um, so the Scottish First Minister, uh, Nicola Sturgeon, uh, is responsible for public services in, in Scotland. Um, in 2014, um, Scotland held a referendum on whether to become independent, and that was lost by about 10 percentage points, um, by 55% uh, to 45%. Um, but but 45%, even if it isn't enough to win you a referendum, um, is enough to win um, a very strong position uh, under the UK's first-past-the-post um, electoral system. So the SNP currently has about 35 MPs. Um, it's hoping to go back up to about 55 MPs, um, which it won in the 2015 election, and to use that as a springboard for another independence referendum, um, which would allow Scotland to uh, become um, an independent country. Uh, they hope uh, that Scotland could become an independent country within the EU, uh, even if the rest of the UK is outside of it. What about the newest party to be competing in these elections, the Brexit party or BXP? Okay, so the Brexit party is, is led by a guy called Nigel Farage, um, who um, was for a long time leader of the UK Independence Party. Um, com campaigning um, during the 2000s and the 2010s for Britain to leave the EU. Um, Farage um, stood down as UKIP leader, um, UK Independence Party leader, after the referendum was won in 2016, um, and then promptly fell out with his successors um, and has founded the Brexit Party as a way of um, re-establishing himself um, in, in political life and I guess increasing pressure on the Conservative Party to deliver the kind of Brexit that Farage has in mind, uh, one that involves a complete break with the European Union um, and um, a very different kind of, of economic model um, to the one that the UK has been following in recent years. So current polling is suggesting that the Conservatives are 10 points ahead of Labour at the time of recording. Why do you think they have so much support at the moment? Well, um, I guess if you think about it, 52% of the electorate voted to leave the European Union um, back in 2016. Um, polls suggest that not all of them um, want um, to stand by that decision. Um, not all of them are convinced that Boris Johnson's withdrawal agreement fulfills the kind of vision of Brexit that they were looking for, um, but most of them do. And, and so Boris Johnson has very um, effectively um, managed to persuade most um, Leave supporters uh, that a Conservative majority government is, is the best way of delivering on Brexit. So you mentioned a little earlier about the first-past-the-post voting system that the UK uses. Uh, can you explain what that is for our listeners who might not be aware of how it works? Yeah, um, I guess a first-past-the-post system involves um, simply um, having... Um, single member seats in which the, the candidate with the most votes wins. Um, so there is no scope for the kind of preferential transfers um, to the, the, the two strongest parties in each seat that you get under the Australian um, alternative vote system. Do you think this leads to tactical voting? You know, people voting for the party most likely to unseat a certain politician rather than who they actually believe in? Well, it certainly creates an incentive for tactical voting, uh, and there has been extensive tactical voting in the past, particularly in the 1990s, um, when supporters of Labour, the Liberal Democrats and the SNP um, voted tactically uh, to get the Conservatives out of power uh, in, in, in 1997. Um, of course, the, there are two, two challenges with tactical voting. One is that it's very hard to know um, who, who the best tactical choice is in, in a, any given seat. On the subject of tactical voting, the far right wing Brexit party has said they will not contest any Conservative held seats. Do you view this as some kind of alliance between the Brexit party and the Conservative party to avoid splitting the right wing vote in those constituencies? Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, um, Nigel Farage's relationship with the Conservative party has been a, a checkered one, shall we say. Um, he certainly wants to maintain some political independence, a kind of uh, 
the ability to threaten the Conservatives um, if, if they don't um, pursue the kind of Brexit that he favours. Um, but he, he originally suggested at the beginning of the campaign um, that the Brexit party would find every constituency. And, and he faced a real backlash for that from, from some Eurosceptic donors um, who, who accused him of sabotaging Brexit um, because the fear was um, that the Brexit party would pull some votes away from the Conservatives. So what he said instead is that the Brexit party will only stand in, in seats which are held by opposition parties. Um, and the hope there, from, from his perspective, is that the Brexit party will be able to pull votes away from Labour um, who might nevertheless um, not want to go all the way over to the Conservatives. Staying on the Brexit party for now, there has been a lot of rumours about a classified report from the Intelligence and Security Committee regarding campaign financing for this election. The Conservative government is refusing to release the report until after the election, but sources we have close to Downing Street state the report allegedly pertains to large amounts of Russian dark money coming into the campaigns of the Conservative and Brexit parties. Do you think there's any truth to these rumours? Yeah, it's certainly entirely plausible, given what we know has happened in the United States and elsewhere, um, that Russian actors may well have been involved in, in turning the referendum. Um, in, in 2016, there was certainly um, quite a lot of dark money um, that was being spent on Facebook ads and, and in other ways that um, it's difficult to know exactly where that came from. Um, and there are, there are reasons for thinking that one of the reasons why Boris Johnson was so keen to have an election this autumn was that it would allow him to um, avoid having to publish that report, um, also to avoid having to release more details of his affair or alleged affair with the American businesswoman Jennifer Arcuri, um, who, um, which has threatened to blow up into a political scandal. Um, and, and also, um, holding the election at this time has allowed him to avoid um, holding a budget in, in November, which would have involved update, the release of updated economic forecasts. Um, the British economy has been slowing um, over the course of 2019, partly because of Brexit-related uncertainty. Um, but the government hasn't yet been forced to confront um, in public um, what the implications of that have been. So if you were the Conservative Party strategist, what would be your advice to the party to help them secure victory? Well, I think the Conservatives have run a pretty sure-footed campaign up to now. Um, they've centred um, the campaign around Boris Johnson, who is divisive, but still probably their best asset. Um, I'd keep attacking Jeremy Corbyn and playing up people's fears of, of a left-wing Labour government, which would put their taxes up um, and which would engage in, in nationalisation um, schemes and, and increased national debt. Um, I think, um, yeah, I keep plugging away at those themes. It seems to be working for the Conservative Party up to now. And what about the Labour Party? What do you think would give them the best chance of victory going forward? I think what Labour needs to do is to continue to try to move the agenda onto issues other than Brexit, which they've done with some success, to try to pull back some of those working class voters who have supported Brexit, but um, dislike the Conservatives on, on other issues. Um, and remember that we have had Conservative-led governments in power in Britain since 2010. Um, we've had significant budget cuts, and so there is um, an undercurrent of disaffection about austerity and, and the state of public services. Um, I think the other thing Labour needs to do is to squeeze the Liberal Democrats and to squeeze um, other, other parties uh, and try to bring back um, voters um, who dislike the Conservatives into the Labour fold um, in the way that, that Labour did quite successfully in, in the 2017 campaign. And last question, what do you think the result of the election will end up being? At the minute, um, I think it looks like there's going to be a Conservative majority somewhere in the region of 30 to 50 seats. Regardless of what the polls say, the British first-past-the-post system makes it much more difficult to pick winners due to people voting tactically rather than who they align with politically. How people are going to vote is a multi-dimensional question on a wide front of issues from a diverse nation of multiple countries. So to get a better idea of how people and the media are digesting this election, we turn to our next guest. Part two, is it better to trust the devil you know? Obviously, the, the Brexit election, but um, as much as specifically the, particularly the Conservatives wanted to frame it as a Brexit um, election, 
of course, other issues have crept up as well, and social issues have crept up as well. The NHS has crept up as well, and actually, interestingly, also the issue of trust, which comes up again and again and again. And yeah, so it's Brexit social trust election. M. K. Hengel is a political correspondent and senior lecturer in journalism for the University of Lincoln. She joins us today. Johnson seems to have the bigger issues at the moment. They've also um, by now notor- an, an infamous, an infamous scene where um, during one of the um, um, broadcasts where leaders were interviewed by by journalists and by the public, the public actually asked him, um, "Why do you think we don't trust, or, or how important is actually the truth for you?" And when he answered, very important, the audience just burst out laughing. And that clearly shows that um, people just don't believe anymore what Johnson says, because he has been famously lying. He has been famously lying during, or infamously rather, uh, during um, the Brexit campaign when he had the slogan of um, um, if you leave the EU, we get um, we, we pay 350 million um, pounds a week to the EU, which was wrong, which was proven to be wrong. The head of the statistics and authority actually repeatedly said that it was a misleading figure, and still he he um, kept um, claiming that that, um, that, uh, that it was the case. But there were other issues as well. So apart from Brexit, the other huge issue for this election is the future of the NHS, the British National Health Service. Uh, For Americans listening, they might know it better as a universal healthcare system that Britain uses. So what I want to know is what are the major parties' proposals for the future of the NHS? There again actually comes comes a trust issue into it because um, um, Johnson and, and the Tories are promising that um, they will, or initially that they they will um, finance 40 new hospitals, and it quickly turned out no, actually not at all. What you're doing, you're upgrading six new hospitals, and, and then then you're discussing new finance for 30, um, 34 new uh, or 34 existing uh, hospitals, and, and upgrading actually six existing hospitals. And even when the, when that was pointed out to them, they were again um, stressing that um, no, these will be new hospitals. And people said no, actually look at your plans; it's not true. So, so for a start, there's again this is trust and this truth issue that, that they're lying about the issue. But then there's also um, very much related to Brexit and the issue about staff. The um, NHS has deteriorated over the last um, 10 years when um, when the Tories were in government. So the waiting lists are at a record um, length at the moment. Um, and and situations you hear from people in who work in the NHS and actually also from patients again quite horrifying stories and and i remember um 20 years ago when i um covered britain for or or started to cover when when i arrived from germany and being a foreign correspondent for german media and and covered the nhs there were these you always had the winter crisis and the the nhs was very fully underfinanced and really had huge trouble and um labor over many years invested a lot with huge problems, but still invested a lot, so the waiting list became um, shorter and the NHS, NHS actually improved. And after the Tories uh, took over and had this sort of um, really up to a point ideological and um, austerity politics, the NHS really markedly um, declined. And um, one of the big problems is that there are not enough staff, and that is exacerbated by um, Brexit because the NHS relies on a lot of staff from abroad and a lot of staff um, arriving from other European countries, and they don't anymore. They don't. Tr- <laughs> they um, they fear what um, how they can live in um, Britain after Brexit. Actually, quite a few people are are leaving, and uh, this very much contributes to to the problem that the NHS has. And Labour, on the other hand. Um, absolutely always had this policy to say that we um, we will not um, uh, privatize the NHS and Labour, I think, is is very much belief in that. And then they say they will usually invest into the NHS, but with Labour, um, they claim their manifesto is uh, completely costed, 
but well we need to see about that so the labor manifesto also discusses nationalizing the railroads and nationalizing the broadband network do you think these are popular policies Actually, actually, the the idea about nationalising um, um, rail and nationalising, or or actually making making free uh, broadband and, and nationalised part of, of the provision, um, is very popular. Especially nationalise nationalising rail. I think about broadband, there is a bit of um, um, question marks. There might be even a huge question mark. I think people are quite surprised by that. Um, obviously. Quite a few um, middle class people have said, why do we need a free broadband? We can well pay for it. Why do we need um, and to, to create a um, politic, politics that is hugely expensive and also um, puts some companies out of um, business? And given that some of the justification for, for free broadband is actually that, and, and Corbyn said, it will help a lot of small companies who need broadband and if they have it for free it, it will give them a boost but by giving these companies a boost potentially put smaller providers of broadband out of business so there has been a lot of allegations that the media including the bbc have been particularly biased in the coverage of this election uh, mostly something from the ratio of pro versus against uh, when it comes to coverage of certain parties as well as a clip that was tactically edited cutting a different year's footage into a video shoot showing Boris laying a wreath at a Remembrance Day ceremony. Uh, they put in footage from the previous year so it didn't show Boris laying the wreath upside down. Uh, do you think there is bias from the BBC or it's just a series of mistakes? The BBC is uh, very heavily under critique and, and recently. And um, during the Brexit campaign, the biggest issue really was that they did not dare to make a sensible judgment what was an, a reasonable position and which was just an, a ridiculous position. So they had, they tried always to bring in, in pros and cons for every argument and had very little judgment and if the um, um, con argument actually had, had not many legs to um, stand on, that was n most not notably for the whole economic argument, because most ec economists were really quite united um, in about the dangers Brexit would bring, and very, very few and an outlier and, 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 and often not very respected um, economists would try to make a point that uh, Brexit could be beneficial e economically. So that was one, one of the points. And then very often there were interviews on, on the main political shows of, of BBC and, and radio where you felt that the interviewers had not sufficient grasp of the details of Brexit, which is of course difficult to do, but if you have such an important and controversial issue, you really need to um, need to have a grasp of, of the details of um, be it negotiations, be it um, different deals on offer. And often they let um, interviewees get away from, um, with um, and too many false claims. And that often were um, in interviews from the Tory party. So that probably could have been seen as a biased um, against or for the Tories against Labour. So to wrap this up, what is your prediction for the election? Who do you think will win? Um, the, um, the likely winner at the moment, it very much looks like uh, the Conservative Party. It, um, there are some polls who put them um, ahead, even at 48 seats, which would um, Johnson actually give a majority that would even allow him to um, pursue a policy um, that the right-wing um, Europhobe and um, European research group would not support. So his, his um, Brexit extremists, he could even play against his um, Brexit extremists. It seems more and more common that we go into an election where the population has little trust in both sides. The election turnout is tipped to be low due to the exhaustion around this issue. There has been wall-to-wall -wall coverage on one thing, Brexit. There is no doubt that Brexit above all is the issue shaping this campaign. The decision around Brexit here will shape the UK's future with Europe and the rest of the world. 
This election will have consequences for decades to come. So what is each side proposing to tackle this, the biggest issue of the election? More for that, we turn to our next guest. Part 3. One foot out the door. So this election, above all else, for most voters, is going to be about Brexit. If they vote for Boris Johnson to be Prime Minister, the current Prime Minister, if they vote for him to get a majority in the House of Commons, then Britain will leave the European Union within a month. If anyone else wins, or if Boris Johnson doesn't win, then there's going to be another referendum on on Brexit, on whether or not Britain leaves the the European Union. So, although uh, at this at this stage, there's a whole other load of issues that are being discussed in this election. And Jeremy Corbyn, the opposition leader, wants this election to be about anything but Brexit. The Prime Minister is trying to frame this election to be basically another referendum on whether or not the UK remains part of Europe or not. Alan Wager is a political researcher at King's College in London, as well as being part of the British think tank, the UK in a changing Europe. He joins us today. Most voters, quite rightly, see this see the, this issue of Brexit as the defining issue that in this in this coming in this coming poll in a couple of weeks. So let's talk about the fallout directly after the referendum. When a leave result came in, Prime Minister David Cameron immediately resigned as PM. Uh, can you elaborate a bit about those first few days of post-referendum Britain? And th- there was no clear direction immediately after the referendum because while people had voted to leave, no one was quite sure what that what that leaving w- would mean. And we no longer had a prime minister at all, let alone one that could even start to carry out any mandate on on, on, the, on what Brexit would would ultimately turn out as. So it was a it was a. It was perhaps an understandable decision. It was perhaps the only decision he could have made, but it it had real implications for what would come to, to happen in the next few years. And for people who might not be aware, were the results of the referendum close? The vote of 52-48 uh, was relatively close. Uh, it meant that in, in, in Wales and in England, people voted to, to, to leave the European Union. But in Scotland and in Northern Ireland, People voted to remain in London, the UK's capital city. People voted 60-40 to remain. But in most parts of England and in the, in the south of the UK, people voted to leave the European, leave the European Union. So it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a 52-48 decision. Uh, but the most surprising thing about that decision was was, was the fact of was the fact of leaving and the fact that leave won. Almost all experts in the run-up to the election, in the run-up to the referendum, felt that people and voters would end up being risk-averse. So when it, come to, when it came down to it, the warnings from the government and the warnings from senior politicians about the economic risks would be all important. But what we saw in the referendum was millions of voters who felt disenfranchised from politics for many, many years, felt that they could come out and vote to change the way politics was, was done in, in the UK. And they were the ones that made all the difference between it being 50, 52, 48 to, to remaining to 52, 48 to leaving the European Union. So what were the Leave voters expecting to get out of this referendum? What were their main goals? In, in, in policy terms, the key issue in the referendum of 2016 was the issue of immigration. So, for, so since 2004 uh, and, and the expansion of the European Union, there have been a, a, a dramatic increase in the level of immigration coming from, coming from the rest of the European Union into the UK. And because the UK was part of the single market, the EU single market, it doesn't have any controls over, over how many people can come to and from the UK. And this was the, the, most, the, 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 the idea of, of, of curtailing freedom of movement was the single most popular public policy in the years leading up to, to, to the referendum. Uh, so that was one of the key drivers of the Brexit vote. And then other people that have analysed the result have shown that economic anxieties were the underlying factor behind explaining some of these, econ- some of these, some of these attitudes to things like immigration. People that had been less well off and, and it felt left out of the, of the UK's sort of political and economic uh, uh, um, prosperity for, for the last few years felt that voting for Brexit was the way of changing the e- economic and political system of the UK to, sort of, to one that was more fair. So immigration may have been the sort of symptom rather than the cause, but it was the single biggest issue 
uh, for most people that voted for Leave in the campaign. So the referendum was in 2016, but they still haven't left the European Union technically. Why has it taken so long to implement the Leave? Well, the UK was a member of the European Union for uh, you know over 40 years, and it was a developing project that that, that slowly sort of encapsulated and and and, and became a, a, and came to define much of the UK's economic model. It came to define the way that we do government in the UK, uh, and it's it's not been tried and it's not been tested before. The act of leaving a political union like the European Union is something that no country has ever attempted or ever successfully tried. And and rewriting sort of rules on trade to become more disadvantageous for both parties is something that that no that no country's ever really attempted to to do. So it's 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 both a result of the of, of the of the scale of the challenge and the the history of the UK's relationship with the European Union and also the unprecedented nature of the challenge. So it's taken us years to get to this stage because, uh, uh, because, because our politics has become divided and become defined by the issue of, of Brexit. Do you think the European Union is making this particularly difficult to send a signal to other countries who might be considering leaving the EU? <laughs> it's, certainly, it's certainly in the EU's interest to show that leaving the European Union is both politically difficult and economically disadvantageous. So the biggest single aspect of the EU's negotiations and the EU's priorities has been protecting the UK, the, the European Union's future and the European Union's single market, its own rules and regulations. That, and, and, and the idea that if the UK wants to leave the European Union, fine, it can do that, but it will it will lose the economic advantages of being part of the trading club of the European Union. Uh, and it's also facing, it feels, an existential threat from other parts of, of Europe, from, for example, Italy and from other populist movements that, uh, in, 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 the, in Eastern Europe. That, and they also uh, pose a potentially existential threat to the European Union. So it's, it's, it's part of managing those other challenges and also sending that signal to other populist movements in Europe. Okay, you can try something like this, but it's not going to turn out very well. With a large majority, both Scotland and Northern Ireland voted to remain as part of the European Union, but they're now being dragged to leave because of the votes in England and Wales. Uh, do you think this will give fuel to the independence movement in those countries? Yes, yeah, so the big strategic uh, problem for those in Northern Ireland, and there's many people in Northern Ireland, who are worried about being part of Ireland and want instead to be part of the UK is that the deal that Boris Johnson has made means that almost inevitably, over time, we're going to get to a situation where Northern Ireland and Ireland, who are part of one land block, are going to increasingly be in the same regulatory space, have the same sort of economic model, and that, that economic model will be different to the rest of the UK. So it really does boil down to quite a big political and economic moment for the UK and the likelihood that one day Northern Ireland and Ireland will become a united country has dramatically increased. So that's the that's going to be the price. That is the price of of Brexit. While Theresa May said, OK, we will uh, we'll accept uh, uh, staying really economically close and losing our, our, our economic liberty as a result of uh, uh, of Brexit. Uh, Boris Johnson has rejected that and instead given uh, uh, Ireland and Europe a bit of the UK's land instead. So it's all part of the, it's, this, this is a different calculation and a different trade-off. And what about Scotland? It's near inevitable that at some point within the next decade there will be a referendum on whether Scotland remains part of the United Kingdom or becomes an independent country. And that's because the leaders of the independence movement in Scotland have, uh, have, have, have quite correctly said that the material circumstances have changed and, and Scotland is no longer in the same position as it was when it had a, a, a referendum on independence, which it did back in 2014. In 2014, uh, those that argued that Scotland should remain part of the UK won 55 to 45. Since then, all the opinion polls have showed there's been a dramatic movement towards uh, independence, particularly among those that voted for remain in 2016 and for the and for Scotland to remain in 2014. 
a common talking point from the Brexiteers is the notion that from outside the EU, Britain could make an independent trade deal with the United States, and that would make up the shortfall from Europe. Uh, do you think this claim holds any water? But the, all the economic modelling shows that the one thing that really still matters in trade is geography. And that's, that's the big problem for the Brexiteers. No matter how many trade deals they make, they won't make up for the loss of trade with Europe. And even, even, even if they could make all those deals, uh, they still won't be able to uh, replicate the, the effects of EU membership. And yet, they, and yet they haven't even been able to make the number of deals that the UK already had as a member of the, of the European Union with third country. The UK, the UK, uh, the UK does, uh, I think, uh, d double the amount of trade it does with, it does with, the, with, with Europe as it does with the, with, the, with the US. There's no way the US trade could ever compensate for the loss of trade uh, with, the, uh, with the European Union if we do leave on the terms as negotiated by uh, uh, Boris Johnson. So at, at the moment, at the moment, uh, but there, there is there is clearly the possibility of expansion of the UK's trading relationship between the US and the UK. The problem is that the the stipulations that the UK government will have to put on that trading relationship in this election, in this general election that's coming up in the UK, the issue of the national health services has been a hugely important and significant issue, and the idea that. US pharmaceutical companies shouldn't have any access to UK markets. In all trade deals the US does with any country, this, it's the access of its, of its, of its, for its pharmaceutical industry into the, into the market is, is, is a significant and crucial factor as a quid pro quo. And, I think it's, and the, U, the UK is already, if, it, if it's already setting limits on what the terms of any US-UK trade deal could be before it's even really begun, it's, it's far from clear the UK is willing to make the sort of trade-offs and make the sort of compromises with the US that would allow it to have that same level of trade uh, with the US as it has with the UK. So Leave voters are also split between the Leave deal Boris Johnson made uh, and crashing out without a deal. Uh, can you explain the ramifications for both of those? So the big, the big thing about having no deal is that on day one of leaving the European Union, there would be no transition period. So what we've got if you have a deal is a, is a transition period when everyone just pretends as if nothing has happened for 12 to 18 months as the UK and the EU try and negotiate something different. Whereas if you have no deal on day one, you drop out. And that would mean that, for example, a whole load of rules and laws that haven't been worked out yet for, for example, for EU citizens that are living in the UK, it would be really unclear where they would stand. But the big problem is, the big problem for, for no deal as opposed, to a, a, as opposed to a deal is that it means that the, the basis of the UK's trading relationship would be on WTO terms. And that sets pretty high tariffs on things like 46%, a 46% tariff on lamb if you want to sell your lamb from Wales and you want to sell it to someone in France, you'd have to pay a 46% tariff when currently you pay 0%, right? And the UK and, and the UK relation, the economic relationship would become increasingly difficult. And the EU is a protectionist club. It wants to protect its economic uh, interests and it would find, and the UK would increasingly find that it was economically disadvantaged if there was a no deal, and they hadn't, and they hadn't come to some sort of agreement on tariffs and on, uh, and on regulations and economic regulations. So it would be the economic hit, as well as the short-term uncertainty, that would be the biggest problem for the UK. So let's find out where all the parties stand on Brexit. Let's start with the Tories. What is Boris Johnson's plan for Brexit? So Boris Johnson has now come back with a uh, deal from the European. Uh, union and he argues that this allows him to get Brexit done. So, he, so that would mean that the UK would formally leave by the 31st of January next year. But this, so this transition period, this period, this brief period of, of respite that leaving the European Union with a deal allows, this sort of buffer period, only lasts until December next year. And Boris Johnson has said, he's made it categorically clear that he won't try and extend this period so if the UK and the EU can't come to a trade deal trade deals normally take about eight to ten years uh, then the UK would track would, would sort of crash out on these WTO terms and the UK would have these really high tariffs with the rest of 
of, of Europe. So, so Boris Johnson has committed himself to a timetable for a, for a trade deal between the UK and the EU that is really, really, really difficult to achieve. But he's telling the electorate and he's arguing that if you vote for him, you'll get Brexit done. In reality, you'll just, you'll just be past the first stage of Brexit and then we'll have a massive a scramble to try and come to some sort of trade agreement with our largest partner that makes up something like 48% of UK trade. Well, the one, the one option for, for Boris Johnson faced with this extraordinary timetable to agree a trade deal would be just to agree with everything the EU wants. You know, it's entirely possible to come to a trade deal probably within a year. It would just be one that would be written uh, and read out by the European Union. So that's, that's the big problem for Boris Johnson. He's, he's saying he'll get Brexit done, but really, you know, that just means he'll get any Brexit deal over the line, no matter how good or bad it is. And what about the Labour Party? What's their policy going forward for Brexit? Well, the number one thing for Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour Party is to try and avoid discussing Brexit at all costs. So they spent the last three and a half years having a basically ambivalent, ambiguous position on Brexit, yet they've now got to a place where they, where they, where because they're, most of their voters, because almost all of their members and almost all of their members of parliament are in favour of remaining, they have promised another referendum on Brexit within six months of the election. So within six months, there'll be a version of, 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 of the deal with, between the UK and the EU, probably with slightly more sort of softer terms, so probably slightly closer to, the, to the Europe's regulatory model versus remaining in the European Union. And that would be within six months of, uh, of this general election. If Labour was to win and call a second referendum, what do you think the likely result would be? So there's been about three and a half years since the Brexit uh, referendum. For two and a half years, uh, there's been hundreds of opinion polls, and there's only been one that has shown a lead for leaving the European Union in the last two and a half years. So we've got a situation where there's a latent majority in favour of remaining in the European Union, and uh, if there was any referendum, it would be highly likely that Remain would win. That's why this, that's why this, this election is, is such a big moment in the UK, because it ultimately is probably a second referendum on, on that Brexit deal. And if, because, it, because if, 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 Jim, if Boris Johnson loses this, this election, it's almost, it's almost inevitable that Brexit would be stopped. And what do you think the likely outcome of the election will be? At the moment, the polls suggest that the Conservative Party are in a pretty strong position. They're something like 12% ahead in the average of all opinion polls. That is a bit more fragile than it looks because you have the fact that because, because the Conservative Party are facing so many different parties in different parts of the UK, they're facing different challenges. So in Scotland, they're facing the challenge of the Scottish National Party. In the north of England, they're facing, they're, they're trying to win in old, Old Labour heartlands that are in favour of Brexit, but also in favour of left-wing left-wing economics, and they're having to try and win uh, seats there. And in the south of England, they're facing the Liberal Democrats in places that voted Remain. So, although they've got a majority at the moment, and it looks like they're on track for a majority, they, they need to have a buffer of about eight percent to be to be to be sure of a majority. And currently, they're they're polling about eleven or twelve percent ahead. So just a 2% swing or something like that to the Labour Party in the next couple of weeks and Boris Johnson could be out of a job. 10 days from now, the UK will head to the polls. December 12 is the date of the election. I highly recommend everyone listening to encourage their friends, their neighbours, their co-workers and their family to get to the polls. Because this election, more than anything, will affect your life going forward for the next decades. Also remember if you live in the UK and you are a Commonwealth citizen, you have the right to vote as well. So to all of our Australian listeners in the UK, I highly encourage you to get out of vote as well. The time to act is now. The referendum was only won by a small majority and the UK elections can go right down to the wire. If you believe in something, then make your voice count. Get out there Flex your democratic right and make the country work for you. Thank you so much for listening to the program. It means so much to us to be seeing the amount of listeners growing exponentially with each and every episode. If you want to follow me, you can find me on Twitter at Michael Elliott Oz. 
or you can find the show on all social media platforms at the red line pod commenting and sharing is a huge help for the show and helps us get out to as many people as possible and i can't thank the people who have already helped out so far enough if you want to follow peter's work you can find him on twitter at pj sloman or check out his book transfer state if you want to follow mk she can be found on twitter at mk henkel and finally if you want to hear more from alan you can follow him at dr alan wager or his think tank on twitter at the uk and eu or you can follow his think tank on twitter at uk and eu once again thank you so much for tuning into the program we will be back next fortnight with another international episode but for now as they say in the uk cheers mate